Good afternoon. Today, we'll talk about games. Games not like the ones that we have done in class, with incumbents and entrants, static and dynamic environments, Nash Equilibria and all this. We're going to talk about more usual games, the video game industry. So video games were around from the 50s, 60s and 70s. And they were in a primitive form where the game itself, the software, was hardwired into the circuitry of the console. So you would buy a dedicated console that would play only one game. This changed in 1976 when a company called Fairchild came out with a console where the hardware and the software were physically separated. So you would buy the console and then you would buy separate interchangeable cartridges or how we called them back then cassettes and then you would play different games at the same console. One year later, a company that most of you know, Atari, came out with a very similar idea, a very similar console, the Atari 2600. And this was a console that was considered from consumers, children back then, to be a superior console to the one that Fairchild was producing. Atari produced the console and produced also different games that users could buy. Once you get bored from the one game, you could buy another and another and another. And this continued for three more years. So you could buy the console and the games from the same company. In 1979, this changed. A group of game creators from Atari left the company and they founded their own company called Activision. Activision was producing cassettes with different games for the Atari 2600 console. So this was a company that for the first time was producing software for another different console, games for a different console. This was highly unusual back in the time. Activision's move was an overnight success. It went very well and drove other creators into the industry producing games for an already existing console. But what was the reaction of the mother company to the situation? In the beginning, Atari saw this move of other independent companies to make software for its own console as a hostile move. However, quickly they started realizing that having independent producers to produce software for your own console it makes your console to be now a platform and having other people producing something for your platform makes the value of this platform for everybody to increase. This was not bad at all for them. Everything changed in the mid 80s when a company that we all know, Nintendo, came out with a new, more modern console, the NES. The NES had a very important difference than other similar consoles of the past. It featured a chip, a physical chip inside the console that would lock out all unlicensed cartridges of games that you would try to plug in. So now, if you wanted to create a game for NES, you should have permission. But this was not the most important achievement of Nintendo. Nintendo practically did the following. So they went to the independent producers of games and they told them, do you remember that before you were producing games and you were selling so people could use in the consoles that other companies were producing? So now you're going to do exactly the same thing, but you're also going to pay us. When independent creators heard that, they were like, sure, okay, let's do it. So if this is not entrepreneurship, going to people and convincing them to do what they did before, but now they have to pay you for doing it, for creating something that will increase the value of your platform, then I don't know what it is. The same platform competition model is followed even today. Every four to five years, a new first round of competition begins after the new models come out. The two most successful platforms usually 
end up with 80% of the market share and in each geographical market usually one of the two platforms finally prevails. Interestingly, 50% of the sales of game consoles come within three months after the first release and nearly 80% of the overall revenue for these companies come after just nine months after the first release. So as you understand, it's very important that you have a solid lineup of games upon introduction of the console. So what is the business model in the video games industry? End users pay for consoles below average cost. So the companies, they run losses from selling the consoles. It's evident that in 2003, Microsoft had dropped the price of Xbox to $179, running a loss for each device that they were selling to the consumer of almost $100. Console platforms then recover their fixed costs and they make the profit from mainly two sources. First, from producing games in-house and selling them directly to the consumers. And second, from royalties from games that independent creators are producing. And this is the reason why when you buy a video game for the first time, you go to the store and you're like, what? $60 for a video game? Seriously? If you didn't recognize, this is a two-part tariff price discrimination model that we have seen before with Polaroid. So you want to price in everybody, you make the price of the prerequisite good very, very small, like Microsoft did and keeps doing with Xbox, and then you charge the enthusiasts who buy more games more by selling the games very expensive. Nice. And simple. This is exactly the opposite from what we saw in the case study for operating systems in the lecture. Remember, Microsoft made its money from the end users, either by selling directly through the retail channel, or secondly, by charging licensing, fee licensing fees for the OEM machines, and then this would be transferred to the final consumer also. So end users paid everything. Software developers and hardware manufacturers that they wanted to be on the platform, they actually created a loss for this company. Apple is also a very similar story. They made money from selling the machine, which actually included the software. Everything was paid by the end user. Nothing was paid by the manufacturers. Nothing was paid by the software developers. This is actually pretty rare for Apple that they do something the same way like Microsoft does it. Hmm, that's interesting. Even though the game console platforms and the operating system platforms seem to be very similar to each other, in the end we see that they behave in entirely opposite ways. This is a brilliant case study to make you understand that every industry has its own personality and this personality is born by the people that they come into this market and they say no forget what we did till now now we're going to do it in a different way this is what nintendo did nintendo came into the market and it said forget that you are making games for free for everybody else now, if you want to do the same, you have to pay royalties. And the industry followed suit. This is something that never happened in the operating system. And today, the two industries, even though they look alike, they grew apart. Mm -hmm.